ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to the Centre for Independent Studies and to this evening's event, which is within the Culture, Prosperity and Civil Society programme at the CIS. It's very good to see you and uh, you're warmly welcome. Well, vainglorious posturing by identity warriors is easy enough, but as Netball Australia has recently found with the withdrawal of major financial support from Hancock Mining, it comes with a price. Pursuit of the ideologically impure generates rancor, anger, and division as slogans and agendas are shouted at those deemed to have offended. General goodwill is in danger of being warped into a state of perpetual outrage, and people ask, how did we get here? Well, theories abound, but tonight's guest, Mary Eberstadt, propounds one of the most interesting explanations. The rise of identity politics, she argues, is a direct result of the fallout of the sexual revolution, especially the collapse and shrinkage of the family. And I'm delighted that she's here this evening in person to tell us more. Mary is one of North America's most notable cultural critics. Her social commentary draws from fields including anthropology, intellectual history, philosophy, popular culture, sociology, and of course, theology. Central to her diverse interests are questions concerning the philosophy and culture of Western civilization. Mary holds the Panula Chair in Christian Culture at the Catholic Information Center in Washington, DC, and she's a senior research fellow at the Faith and Reason Institute. She is an American writer whose contributions to the intellectual landscape traverses genres and nations. I'm delighted that Mary Eberstadt is with us this evening. Will you please welcome her to the stage? Thank you, Peter, for that kind introduction. I'm thrilled to be in Australia. This is my first time here. This trip has been four years in the making, and uh, my husband, Nick, who's also here with me, and I could not be happier. <clears throat> Our subject tonight is the red-hot one of identity politics. A lot has been said about identity politics during recent years, from all political directions. On any given day, news stories abound with references to newly formed political groupings based not on traditional ideas of compromise and give and take, but instead on absolutist insistence. We are informed that characteristics like race and gender and ethnicity now countermand longstanding norms of justice that they trump ordinary politics. In the United States, several such factions are constant staples of the news. <clears throat> Black Lives Matter, white nationalist groups, the many satellites orbiting the universe of LGBT, and innumerable other factions, left and right. To list these groups together is not to suggest moral equivalence. It is instead to observe that diverse as their political goals may be, all of these groups and more share two features. One expressed nonstop wherever videos and microphones are found is rage against real or imagined injustice. The other is the notion that the ends they seek cannot be achieved through conventional means in our self-governing societies. Many people have asked what this new kind of politics is doing to us as Americans, as Australians, as Westerners. Tonight, I would like to focus on a different question, which is what the nonstop obsession with identity is telling us about ourselves, our society, and the social changes beneath the news cycle that have led the West to this divisive place. So in what follows, we'll examine the rise of identity politics. And in the second part, I will propose a theory about how that rise came to be. So begin with the widest aperture. The search for self, the need to know who we are, is a universal question. It animates many of the greatest works of art and literature in the human patrimony. Shakespeare's Hamlet is famously centered on that very question, 
and so is classical drama surviving from ancient Greece, etc. The entire country of Australia, like that of the United States, is in one sense an enormous petri dish for studying how people identify themselves within a multi-ethnic diverse society. So the point, at least on the surface, is simple. Every culture and every individual from time immemorial tries to answer that question, who am I? And today, across the Western world, many people are finding that question harder to answer than ever before. That is what the clamor over identity is all about. That's what we're here to try and understand. Now, in an ordinary sense, of course, questions of political identity are eternal. Fluctuation in political identity is a fact of life, especially in free countries where citizens change their minds and their votes. Again, these kinds of alterations of political identity are nothing unusual. They are healthy signs of a free society at work. But identity politics is a radically different phenomenon from traditional approaches to self-governance. And to see why, I would like to offer a little bit of history. That very phrase, identity politics, is relatively new. It first appears in 1977 in the United States in a manifesto published by a feminist group called the Combahee River Collective. In that document, these radical African-American feminists reject the idea of traditional forms of community. They embrace the idea that political identity should be based instead on victimization. The authors made several declarations that charted a radically new course for American politics. They declared that they were giving up on making common cause with the men in their lives. They ruled the conventional family and the conventional community out of bounds. They said, in effect, that the only people they could trust were people just like them, victims who shared the same oppression. There is a straight line from that manifesto in 1977 to, for example, the Black Lives Matter rhetoric of today. That movement also stands against the conventional family. It also declares peaceful coexistence with the wider community to be somehow unwanted, maybe even impossible. And like all other identitarian groups, left or right, its rhetoric abounds with anger at the world's injustices while running short on practical remedies or policies. The same is true of identity groups based on features other than race or ethnicity. The political wing of what is called the LGBTQ community, for example, is just as absolutist and just as hostile to traditional ideas of tolerance as other identitarian groups. It is also just as insistent in dividing the known political universe into two simple factions, allies and enemies. So this is the first point to note about identity politics, I think. It is born out of loss. Identity politics says, in effect, that the most important thing about an individual is not that person's heritage or family, or community. It is instead that person's status as a victim. This claim to victim status takes different forms. Some groups claim to be victims of the so-called patriarchy. Others say they are victims of racial or cultural bias. And still others claim that the very categories of male and female amount to attempts to oppress them. Now, these groups share a few other features as well. One is the insistence that any given group cannot be properly understood except by the people inside it. Another is the claim that victim status is the new divining rod for truth, not reason or knowledge or empathy or civics. 
And third, and perhaps most important, these groups command and receive absolute loyalty from their members, the kind of unthinking primal loyalty formerly associated with the family. This is a point to which we'll return. So what does the proliferation of all these groups tell us? My thesis, developed in the book Primal Screams, is that today's people, especially today's young people, have been deprived by radical social changes of the usual ways of constructing identity. For that reason, they struggle, as most of our ancestors did not, for answers to that question, who am I? Now, sometimes the deprivation they suffer has been accidental. The consequence of deep social trends, primarily the sexual revolution, rocking all of our societies since the 1960s. Sometimes they've been deprived, at least in part, on purpose. A host of radical thinkers throughout the last hundred years have thought that radical change would be beneficial. The consequences to ordinary people be damned. Feminist Betty Friedan declared the natural family to be akin to a concentration camp. Progressives across the West today compare churches and homeschooling to child abuse. And there are many other examples one could name in this vein. But the point is that many forces have gone into the atomization that we see today. Some of them defending this indiscriminate deinstitutionalization in full. So if we want to understand why our societies seem so riven and split into factions, understanding that many influential thinkers in the West have willed it so is a good start. So let's zero in now on what I think are the two most important such changes of the past 60 years or so, the years in which identity politics were born. Changes to the family, and changes to the churches, and by extension, organized religion generally. So first up, the family. Up until the middle of the 20th century, human expectations remained largely the same throughout the ages from what we can see of the record. That one would grow up to have children in a family if one were fortunate, that parents, siblings, and extended family would remain one's primal community, and that, conversely, it was a tragedy not to be part of a family. For many Westerners today, these facts still hold, but it has to be emphasized that for many, family ties have nonetheless weakened as never before in history. Why? In three words, the sexual revolution. The mass adoption of contraception, beginning with the technological shock of the birth control pill, would go on to have massive and compounding social consequences. And there is increasing agreement on this by thinkers across the political spectrum, as you probably know. The sexual revolution erased the givenness into which generations are born. It turned behaviors that had once been rare into ordinary facts of life for many millions. To observe this is not to point fingers or engage in a blame game. There's hardly a family in the world not affected by some of the things I'm about to list. It's instead to make a point about human arithmetic. Abortion, fatherlessness, divorce, single parenthood, childlessness, the shrinking family, the shrinking extended family, every one of these post-pill developments that are now common have had the effect of reducing the number of people we can call our own. Every one of them is an act of human subtraction. And again, every one of these trends, once rare or unusual, have increasingly become the norm across the West since the 1960s. In fact, 
in a very few decades, there won't be anyone alive who does remember life before the sexual revolution reconfigured the world in this way. I certainly don't remember such a world. I'm guessing most people here don't either. Which makes it all the more important, arguably, that we try to understand its transformative period power here and now. Now, to say that these changes have radically affected Western lives is not to say that everyone is equally affected. It's to say that we share a collective environment. And just as a factory dumping toxins into a lake will affect some fish more than others for reasons that scientists don't understand, the same is true here. Cre considered together, these acts of human subtraction amount to a massive disturbance of the human ecosystem. Or to put the point another way, family reality for many, many of today's Western people can be summarized in one word, fewer. Fewer brothers, sisters, cousins, children, grandchildren. Fewer people to play ball with or talk to, or learn from. On the point about playing ball, the rapper Tupac Shakur, who's surely known to some here, wrote possibly the saddest song of the last 50 years. It's addressed to his father, and it's about a boy trying to play catch by himself. Now, these have been massive and mostly underattended transformations in the way ordinary human beings live. And these acts of subtraction can also be found at every stage of human life. Fewer people to celebrate a given birth, fewer people to visit one's deathbed. And of course, fewer people with whom to mark these great events including in the other foremost institution in which humanity has participated from time immemorial, religion. This brings us to the second most transformative change since the 1960s, the decline of organized religion, especially Christianity, in significant parts of the Western world. This, too, has been a great and parallel exercise in human subtraction. Around 10 years ago, I wrote a book called How the West Really Lost God to try to understand what was behind that decline. Tonight, let's just mention a few statistics in passing. In 2021, just under 44% of Australians called themselves Christian in the census. 50 years ago, in 1971, fully 86% still called themselves Christians. So from 86% in 1971 to just under 44% today, in effect, the percentage of the Australian population calling itself Christian has been cut in half in 50 years. Australia is far from alone. Every society in the West exhibits the same growing indifference to organized religion. Uh, in the United States, as in Australia, the category no religion is the fastest growing subset of all and much the same pattern can be found across Western Europe. Uh, as for the United Kingdom, although the number of people calling themselves Christian still hovered around 51% a couple years ago, only 27% of Britons report that they actually believe in a god. And I had to read that twice when I first came across it, but that's, that's the quote. Now, why does the decline of church going and religious belief matter to the idea of identity? As it turns out, it could matter quite a lot. First, religion hands believers a profound way of answering that question, who am I? It is, I am a child of God. That's the Christian answer to the question of my identity it's not about my sex or my skin color or my erotic longings, but about my relationship to my creator and the cosmos. Now, for Christians and people of other faiths, of course, this way of understanding one's primordial relationship to others remains. 
But with the rise in unbelief across Western societies, many people, especially younger people, cannot answer that question, who am I, by reference to a transcendental realm. Many have no idea there even could be such an answer. And so one more way of constructing identity has been taken off the table. The simultaneous decline of faith and church matter to identity for another reason, this one prosaic. Not only does religion confer an abstract understanding of supernatural identity, it also delivers real life communities made of real life people. People who worship together, mourn together, celebrate together, sing together, work in soup kitchens and hospitals together, and the rest of the program. So the point here is twofold. Splitting, splitting the human atom into recreation and procreation has produced a people deficit. Simultaneously, splitting the temporal world off from the eternal world has produced souls with nowhere to go. And both collapses have left Westerners with fewer trusted people from whom to learn. This is a critical fact about society in the West that is not well understood, I think, and needs to be. We human beings, like all other animals, learn from our kind around us. And like other animals, when we are deprived of our fellow creatures, we learn less. In Primal Screams, I get into animal science that I think bears directly on this question of social learning. So it's no wonder that there are whole new forms of confusion in our time, including over elemental questions like male and female. The sexual revolution subtracted the number of role models who were immediately available and trusted who could help to form an answer to that. And simultaneously, the unchurched revolution removed the building blocks of community from many lives. So in summary, today's identity crisis has deep roots that I believe are treatable, but they cannot be treated without first recognizing their source, which is social and familial deprivation. The dispossessed literal and figurative children who have become the foot soldiers of identity politics may not be large in number compared to the majorities in our societies, but they will not go away or become productive participatory citizens until the crisis that has unhinged them and severed them from their own is somehow addressed. And addressing it first requires understanding it, which is what we're trying to do tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Mary, thank you very much indeed for that, um, for that thesis, for that argument. Uh, a number of questions are, occur to me. I'll start with the family because you, um, you pin a lot really on the disintegration of the family or what you argue has been the disintegration of the family. And I wonder, how do you respond to critics who say that the patterns of family life are always evolving and that we must not keep looking to the past. I mean, there have been momentous changes in, in human society over the years. One thinks of the Black Death and the implications of the, back, the consequences of the Black Death, the Protestant Reformation, the, the rise of commercial society. So patterns are always changing. It, are you pinning rather a lot on, some, on an institution that is simply evolving rather than disintegrating? I am pinning a lot on it because I'd observe that in contradistinction to say the Black Death, this is something we have brought upon ourselves that we are also told we should celebrate. We are not told that, say, the Christian rule book and uh, the shrinking family, et cetera, that we, we are not told that these things are socially neutral. We are told that the sexual revolution was a great boon to humanity. And one of the things this argument does is bring out the thought that actually it's had a lot of deleterious consequences. 
This is what people don't want to face. This is why we hear the objection. Isn't the family always evolving? Aren't children resilient? Can't people just reinvent themselves constantly? In a small measure, yes. But what we have done to ourselves, what we have inflicted on ourselves, is hurting a lot of us. And there's great resistance to seeing that. So I pin a lot on the family for that reason, not in order to point fingers, but just to say, let's look at the collective environment here and what's happened to it. Do you think that the, the rise in uh, concern about the mental health of young people is directly related to this? Absolutely. I've been writing about that for 20 years because for at least 20 years, psychiatrists and other researchers have agreed that there is a real uh, rise that is not a statistical artifact of some kind in anxiety, depression, obsessive compulsive disorders, and things like that across uh, at least American young people. I'm less familiar with the figures in, in Europe. But uh, this is obviously part of the picture. What is wrong with these kids? Materially, they're not badly off, most of them. Um, generationally, they suffer the same growing pains of adolescence that other adolescents have always suffered. Clearly, there's something else going on here. And I think uh, it has to do with loneliness and atomization. Some of the latest studies on loneliness in the West are showing that, uh, yes, old people are the loneliest of all, except for people in their 20s who are lonelier still. So we are seeing flashing signs out there uh, that something is uh, seriously wrong with a significant number of our young people especially. And I think it's past time for the West to pay attention to those things. And what's going wrong is, is a, a loss of a sense of identity, as you've said. And this lies behind that, that claim to have things that I can call mine. You make, a, you make that, you emphasize that very strongly in the book that I need to be able to say what is mine, and if it's mine, it can't be yours. We're seeing that run through so many social conversations these days. Yes, I think the language in which <clears throat> identity politics is couched tells us something important. So in the furor over, say, cultural appropriation, the idea that if you're not Mexican-American, you can't make a tamale to take it to a ridiculous extreme, to which it's often taken, uh, What's going on there? Why are people so frantic to say what is theirs? And I think it's, it's a regression to a kind of toddler-like state in which that's mine, that's mine and you can't have it. And the, the panic behind that kind of assertion, I think can be seen elsewhere in identity politics. Look at the meltdowns over pronouns. What does that tell you? You know, it's pretty common for people who are more traditional-minded or conservative-minded to make fun of this sort of thing because it's easy and there's a lot of it out there. But I think that the deeper meaning uh, is much more unsettling. I don't think that the people who adopt this kind of politics are doing it because they're, they're evil. Uh, I think they're doing it because they're desperate. And the language betrays that. And that sense of desperation, it seems, is also now engulfing women who, and this is one of the paradoxes of identity politics, which you bring out very, very concisely, that for all the empowerment that women uh, enjoy in society, it seems that they are, they've never been more vulnerable. In other words, vulnerable to sexual predation, vulnerable to misogyny, vulnerable to all kinds of discrimination. How do you account for that paradox that when just as we see, we seem to be seeing women emerging in, in the fullness of their identity, they seem to be under assault or feel that they are under assault? I think they are more vulnerable than they used to be for several reasons. Number one, again, the sexual revolution has taken out of their lives uh, protective, trusted male figures whether it's through fatherlessness or through the fact that families are so much smaller, many girls don't have brothers, protective uncles, et cetera, the kind of community on which uh, women, young women, once relied to protect themselves. That's one problem. 
uh, I was especially struck by that problem when I was reading through some of the accounts of the Me Too movement and these stories that young women were telling about what had happened to them because of predatory men. Without prejudging who was right and who was wrong in any particular case, one thing was very clear. These young women, most of them in elite uh, circles like Hollywood, uh, journalism, these young women, the products of our finest schools, in almost no cases did anybody report a male relative going to this accused man and saying, knock it off. That was stunning. In almost no cases were there reports of men playing a protective role in the lives of these young women, except for a couple of instances I can remember where a couple of boyfriends played that role. Uh, so women are feeling more vulnerable because they are more vulnerable on that account, and they are also more vulnerable because pornography is ubiquitous and they have no idea uh, who's into it, uh, and they hear very little uh, from secular sources uh, about the idea that this might be bad for them, this might be bad for romance, this might be bad for human relationships. So. I think there are threats out there that didn't used to exist. I think we see this also in the transgender uh, movement, if that's the right word. In the United States, some two thirds of the young people who are presenting for um, uh, treatment to become like the other sex are girls. These are almost all young women. Now, what would ever give them the idea that this is a terrible world in which to be a young woman, so terrible that the only solution is to become a young man? Again, um, I think it's a threat-rich environment in a way that it didn't used to be, and that's what they are reacting to. Not that they're conscious of reacting to it that way, but I think that's what's going on underneath. You said at the, towards the end of your remarks that this is a fixable problem. But how is it fixable? How do we, it, let's take the relationships between men and women, or young men and young women, how do we re-socialize young men and young women to equip them for the sorts of relationships that might give them a greater sense of, of, uh, of stability or stable identity? Well, the first thing to do is to go after the things that are hurting them. And one of the things hurt, hurting them is uh, pornography, as mentioned. So for the policy-minded out there, um, prosecuting obscenity wouldn't be a bad start uh, for some of what ails young men and young women these days. Um, but also, we need to push back against what I think is this pernicious story they've absorbed, because it's been put out for 60 years now, which is that men and women are the same, and uh, the diff any Differences are a matter of indifference. There's just a lot of remedial learning that needs to happen in a world where so many people have fewer people to learn from in the first place. You talk about prosecuting obscenity. Do you think there is a place for restoring blasphemy as an offense? Or is that going too far? That's the part of the questioning where I say I'm not a lawyer, and so I leave it to the lawyers to answer that question. <laughs> uh, but it depends a, a, on the statute. Uh, okay, as a, a <laughs> as a theologian, is there a place for blasphemy in a, in a liberal society? I think before we even get to a question like that, we have so much groundwork to do that uh, may even take that question off the table. In other words, what about? pro-family policies? What about policies that make it easier for young people to get married, stay married, have families, have families of size? Uh, of course, there are experiments that do and don't work, but we need to try as many as we can because we're coming from a very broken place where more and more what were said to be individual decisions about the sexual revolution. These are private matters, right? We've heard this for 60 years. These are private matters only. This is only about what private, you know, consenting adults do. No, we are seeing the consequences of this new way of living in politics and across society and in, I believe, phenomena like the rise in mental health problems. So 
we need first to understand what it is that's ailing so many people, going really to the roots of it, which is what I'm trying to do here, and then we can talk more about how to restore things. One of the things I really enjoyed about Primal Screams was that you invited three critics to engage with the argument, Rod Dreher, Peter, Mark Liller, and Peter Thiel. And then you in turn responded to what they had to say. And I thought that was actually a very creative and courageous thing to do, to open oneself to, to criticism between the covers of a book. Um, one of the critics, Peter Thiel, points to the problem of, of economic stagnation as a major factor in the social changes that you map. He says identity politics functions as a cheap substitute for economic progress. Identity politics as a substitute for economic dynamism, do you buy that? I thought that was a very smart point that he made because he was saying that if we're wondering about what we now call woke corporations and why they are woke, it's because it's the cheapest thing for them to do, to throw a bone toward identitarians and make them happy and be uh, you know, on, on the right side of history. Uh, and his point was this isn't fixing anything, which is also true. But to, to his um, objection that if we just straightened out the economics, the rest of this would fall into place, uh, I don't think that's true. Because if, there, if family formation, for example, uh, is harder than it was before, if some young men who have been living in their basements have no idea even how to start on this thing, then giving them the best blue collar jobs in the world isn't going to give them the blueprint for that, which is why these are, I think, primarily social, not economic issues. Do you think these things from your research and your observation, uh, and I know this is your first visit to Australia, but do you think these changes are, um, are about to happen here, that America, that the United States stands as a warning to other countries? Or do you think it's already happening in Australia? I would defer to the Australians, but from what I've heard so far on the visit, I think uh, something toxic has come across the Pacific. Uh, I wouldn't blame America first for it. Um, I, it's happening. Um, I wouldn't blame America first for it because I think all the Western countries are participating to different degrees in this thing that has the same roots. Another critic, Mark Liller, um, made a criticism that was we've, we've all sort of covered already, but I want to uh, draw attention to what Liller says because I thought he made a very interesting observation. Uh, and he was the one who, he was what, the critic who argued that you were making one cultural fact uh, or, or, or event, as it were, bear a lot of the weight of explanation. And he uh, points that the great scattering, as you refer it, can better be explained by, first of all, the growth of wealth and its concomitant material prosperity, and also by what he called the liquidity of contemporary life and the supercharged capitalism of our age. Social institutions melt, but they never re-solidify into new ones, he says. How do you respond to criticism such as Mark Lillard's, in, in particular, this point about the liquidity of contemporary life? So in the book, as you know, I argue that this, the sexual revolution is not the only problem out there that's causing this kind of atomization. Uh, and then I list contributing uh, causes. But at some point, I get frustrated with this argument of, well, that's just modernity. Modernity is liquid, you know, and sort of throw up the hands. Because the fact is that some of this is ours to redirect if we have the, the will and the awakening it will take to redirect some of these changes. Um, one example, one analogy I like to use is um, say tobacco smoking. Um, and I say this not to stigmatize smokers, but we all know that there's been an absolute sea change in the way that tobacco smoking is regarded in the Western world. Um, I can even remember as a little girl when you, not I, but adults could smoke in hospital rooms as long as there wasn't oxygen in the room. That's how, <laughs> I think, uh, that's how common it was. That's how accepted it was. and. It looked as if this thing was never going to go away. It was fun. The adults liked it. It was everywhere. Now, 
60 years after that, we can see that there's been a great change in the social consensus surrounding tobacco across the world, not only the Western world. So what did it? What did it was the insistence, uh, beginning with a very tiny minority of health professionals, that this stuff taken in excess could really hurt people and we ought to do something to make it harder to get or uh, less rewarding to use in public spaces, et cetera. So there we have a very interesting example, I think, of how in the face of evidence concerning harm, society will sometimes renorm itself. And I don't think that's impossible in the case of the sexual revolution. I think there's already revisionism underway to say maybe this wasn't the greatest thing for women. And I'm talking about revisionism not coming from the churches, uh, but, but from the left. There's a very interesting series of second looks going on right now. So I am hopeful that down the road, uh, we will not just shrug and say, you know, this is modernity, baby, get used to it. Uh, I think we might say, stop shrugging and let's think about how to curtail this thing. When you talk about tobacco and the society's capacity to renorm, <clears throat> I do wonder if we ever learn, because currently in the United States and also in this country and in the UK, there's a great movement to, uh, to normalize the consumption of cannabis, even though there is mounting evidence of the psychological harm that cannabis does. But proponent advocates say, um, you know, it's overstated. So there's evidence which we, my point is that once again, it seems we're confronted with evidence that something is harmful. And I wonder to what extent we really do have our capacity to, to re-norm. Um, I wrote an essay for The Spectator on that subject called More Drugs, Just What America Needs. <laughs> because... The, the legalization of cannabis went through with shocking speed, and a lot of it happened during the pandemic when I think no state government felt in a mood to say no to anything that would keep people from jumping off their roofs. Um, but I agree with you that this experiment is going to look very bad in the rearview mirror. And I also think, to Mark Lilla's point, which, which is legitimate, un- Trammeled capitalism does have something to do with this. Big pot is a big industry. It, this legalization of cannabis wasn't coming from uh, farmers who are growing it in their fields. It's coming from a big industry, and industries can also make mistakes, um, which doesn't excuse government being complicit in that. But I, I agree with you. I think that's another. That's a bad one. Just one more question before we open up to uh, to questions from the audience. I'd like to ask you a bit more about loneliness, uh, because uh, as you said, loneliness is endemic uh, in in society in our uh, in Australia also in societies, n not just amongst the elderly but amongst the young, as families um, uh, disintegrate and grandparents are separated from parents and parents from uh, or, or grand, gr grandparents are no longer grand sorry the elderly are no longer grandparents that's precisely the problem <clears throat> how how long does it take a society to reverse that slide into into entrenched loneliness which has psychological material mm -hmm. and uh, and social consequences that's a great question peter and i think the answer is we don't know because this grand experiment that I'm trying to describe, this, this sexual revolution thing and all of its fallout, is really relatively new in human history. So how are we going to know how to fix the problem of loneliness in, uh, in the elderly, which is largely a problem of familylessness among the elderly? Um, I think all we can do is take note that this is a, this is a tragic problem and that Maybe we need to look at the other end of life's telescope to babies to see how this problem gets fixed. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Members of the audience, some questions. Um, hello, Mary. Um, my name is Cassandra. How do, to me, one of the big problems in the West is or has been and is the demonization of men. So when we, we, we look at why young women who are very vulnerable um, I don't have those protectors anymore is because I think men are very reluctant to step up and quite frankly I don't blame them because they're constantly under attack for whatever they do. 
So how can we deal with that? Because I think we need to celebrate the male. I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> I, uh, masculine virtues, and even, and by the way, in some contexts, to use that word I used several times tonight, protective, that is, even that is regarded as a loaded word. But if you take away from men anything to protect, and if you say that it is even wrong to have that feeling of wanting to protect, then you're pretty much uh, casting them adrift to be nothing but predators if they're so inclined. Um, what do you make of the incel phenomenon? Incel meaning um, mainly men who are involuntarily celibate, who um, have been checking out of society. They can't have. A, they can't find a job. They're not looking for any um, any sexual partners. They're not. Um, they're basically um, checking, looking over. Um, you know, certain hobbies like looking um, like pornography and playing video games. So, do you think it's an it's a real phenomenon? And if so. Um, how can we deal with that in so that you know these people could uh, could be looking in a more optimistic path? Yes, that's a great question. Yes, I think the incel phenomenon is a real phenomenon, and I think it fits very well with the idea that there has been a social breakdown here. Young men of uh, mating age, as you said, uh, haven't previously in history, stayed in the basement playing video games. I think that this generation has been deprived of very elementary knowledge of how to approach the opposite sex. They've been deprived of role models for knowing how to be young men. And so confusion is rampant. Let me give you one example from animal science that I think is really telling here. I, I mention it in the book. <clears throat> so... I don't know who has a cat. I, I'm not allowed to have cats because my husband is allergic, but I like cats. And so if you don't live in the city and you have a cat, you're familiar with the fact that some cats can go up trees and get down from them. And some cats go up trees and you have to call the fire department because they haven't learned how to get out of the tree. This has been studied because it's a mystery. And the answer, scientists think, is social learning. The cats that know how to get down from the tree have had the opportunity to study, typically siblings and mother, uh, to learn how to get out of trees. And cats that can't get out of trees haven't had that model before them. Typically, they are house cats who are living you know, in an isolated way. So I don't think we need to worry too much about the cats, but I do think we need to worry about what this says about us when we've taken, we collectively, inadvertently, have removed from the lives of so many young people uh, that subtracted uncle who could have taught you how to play soccer or that imaginary sister who could have taught you something about what the opposite sex is like before you got launched into the mating game. This is what I mean by social breakdown. This is what we're seeing out there. What would you say to the proposition that as a society we've become a lot less resilient? The old saying of sticks and stones will break my bones but names will never hurt me doesn't exist anymore. That is part of this new intolerance that we're all living with for sure. The fact that people are not acting like adults, they're acting like toddlers or children who have been mortally offended by being called a name which goes again to this point that uh, people are not acting like functioning adolescents and young adults in particular. They are acting like they haven't gotten out of this, those earlier stages, um, which, again, I attribute to a certain kind of social breakdown, not a permanent or inevitable one, but one that we are witnessing. I can think of two books that have been published just in the last year or so, in addition to your own, that criticise the sexual revolution. One is The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self by Carl Truman, who I understand is an evangelical theologian in the US. And the other is A Case Against the Sexual Revolution by Louise Perry, who is a secular journalist in London. My question is, do you think that there is a growing backlash against the sexual revolution growing in our society or am I being a bit 
optimistic. It's not surprising coming from Carl Truman, whose work I, I greatly respect, but when women on the secular side of things and women who identify, say, as feminist foremost start making some of the same points, I think that's very interesting, and it's also not surprising. Um, it's to say that ideas get around, and the idea that we are witnessing something novel and uniquely deleterious that's going on uh, in our species is an idea that I think has just been waiting to happen. I, I would predict we will see more of that. Mary, thanks for that. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. Uh, you've, you've described uh, appropriately some of the dynamics impacting upon young people uh, in this space, but what to do about it? You know, so the, everyone can agree that yes, there is a there's a problem. That we can observe the the issues impacting upon young people, but there's a, and a, a lot of calls to action. I feel sorry for, in particular, for educators and, and other departments that have taken a lot of responsibility on to try to address issues of of of, of things like consent and, and understanding appropriate behaviour uh, uh, among others. But no one can really point me to interventions, for instance, that seem to be actually improving outcomes for people. What do you have to say to that? I mean, I think the interventions have to come from uh, changing minds and hearts one at a time in a way that gets translated into personal behavior. And so, for example, uh, I know plenty of n not just, say, liberals, but conservatives, plenty of religious people uh, who have counseled their daughters to go through college and get the degree and establish themselves in a career first. These are parents who love their daughters, who mean well. I think given the kind of social evidence we are seeing to tell a young woman that she should wait until she's 30 or 35 to really think about having a family is the worst possible advice. So one answer to your question is... Uh, Bring back earlier marriage. <laughs> Tell the people who ask your opinion on this what you think of that. Not that everyone should willy-nilly get married, but the current uh, dominant uh, approach to marriage and family formation, I think, is way off kilter. Uh, so that's one, one kind of response. In other words, I don't think it's for teachers to write the answers. I don't... I, I, I think... As a principle of subsidiarity, this has to be fixed uh, further down, for starters. But if I may just interject and say that that will be an example where we're being carried along on the, on the tides of technology because uh, IVF technology, which is improving or changing, developing all the time, is just making it easier and easier for people to defer those, those decisions. Yes, and um, I'm not here to knock corporations, but I... I do wish young women would understand that when they're in a snazzy job and the corporation offers to freeze their eggs, for example, as happens, so they can be mothers any time they want to be is the implied promise. First of all, the promise is false. And second, they need to understand that, um, you know, women are great in the workplace. Women are so great in the workplace that corporations will do a lot to hold on to them, that a lot of things that are not necessarily in a young woman's interest if what she has in mind someday is marriage and a family. Mary, some 40 years ago, I was involved in student politics and um, at university we were combating what I would call uh, economic and political Marxism. We congratulated ourselves 10 years later that um, that particular phenomenon seemed to have been beaten with the fall of the Soviet Union. I'll leave China aside. But what had happened is something I think that we missed at the time, and that was that Marxism in the universities had manifested into a cultural analysis in which class analysis was actually being applied to the family. So, in fact, you were finding that um, male dominance became a feature. Um, fatherhood was now seen as a, a matter of oppression with um, uh, women being encouraged to oppose it and, and children. And uh, what then was concurrently emerging was the fact that sexual identity was, a, was moved from the biological notion of sex, XXXY, to gender, which is a sociological concept. Uh, and that's taken hold. And I just wonder how you now see that playing out 
and how we now try to manage that because culturally it's become embedded in our universities and it's cascading both through the public and the private sectors uh, in a way that's now very difficult to manage. Great question. I think there will be a backlash to all of that. I have no idea how far off it is, but it's very encouraging that in the United States right now, that the parents of America who have kids in public schools seem to have been awakened uh, by being exposed to some of what their kids are being taught in those schools. And so there are local fights all over the place uh, about this. And it's not all gender ideology stuff. There are also questions of, are kids being taught to hate their country? Uh, kids being taught that men are bad? Answer is yes, yes. Uh, but that's to say, again, five years ago, there was nothing like this kind of reaction on the horizon. So I, I think, I hope, what we'll see is a trickle-up effect that will eventually affect the universities. Picking up on an earlier question, I'm really interested to know, in this new paradigm, because it is a new paradigm. So addressing sort of, well, we can't change it, but where do we go to from now? And, and I have in, I've got two in, within my family, one my own daughter and a niece who are both within that LBGTQIA community and one has transitioned. And as a family, we have to live with that and we have to accept that and we have to, um, you know, pay a certain respect and, and to, towards that. So it's a difficult world for us as parents to negotiate, you know, this new generation. I also have a daughter in her 30s who is in a relationship and I've said to her, just have children, have them now. But, you know, I'm, it's like I can only say that once. So, so you know, it's where do we go to in this new paradigm? So how do, we, how do we address a lot of the issues that you've been talking about in a way that is going to bring them along with us uh, rather than, you know, uh, turning them further away from us. So one interesting thing is that if you ask women across the political spectrum what they want most in life, even now, most say marriage and family, in including all over the left, which is to say we've got to count a little bit on human nature kicking in here just a bit. Um, my, my hope is that by putting this record out there that's so hard to talk about, uh, but so important, that there will be a shock of recognition, um, because I think that that shock of recognition is coming to say, you know what, um, if you want to have children, now's the time to think about it, which people can cannot always hear from other adults, right? But I think uh, given what we are seeing, given that what we are seeing resonates with the innermost being of most women, that is to say, uh, marriage is harder than it used to be. Children are like impossible to imagine. I, is this what I want? I think that internal conversation is happening already and I think we can push it along just by making this case in the public square. That's my hope. That's a part of why I do it. Uh, Mary, um, this is under the heading of renorming. Um, the excellent online magazine Unheard, which Peter Curti is familiar with, I believe, uh, had an article recently which was very surprising. It said that the hottest club in New York City was the Catholic Church. <laughs> and it went on to say that the reason for that was that it offered structure and liturgy and uh, you know, an explanation of the beginning and ending of life. And that was attractive to young people who were lost. So I'm just wondering if you're seeing any sort of recognition or evidence of that sort of tendency yourself. I see it all the time. And for example, uh, my husband Nick and I teach in Poland in the, in the summers uh, we participate in a graduate seminar on Catholic social teaching that's run by uh, George Weigel. And uniformly, the most on-fire Catholics are, are coming out of broken places. I also see this in another place where I teach uh, in Washington, D.C., the Catholic Information Center, which brings people in uh, because they have been raised in this uh, this sea that they no longer want to swim in. And in many cases, these are young people who were not exposed to any kind of organized religion, 
but who got tired of seeing their friends, and, and I'm, I'm quoting literally from someone I was talking to recently, uh, overdose or miss class in the morning or uh, have a nervous breakdown about her boyfriend again, et cetera. So the, the brokenness out there is throwing these people into other orbits, potentially. And I think there is a lot to work with about that. A lot of the parents that I come across are not happy with what their children or grandchildren are being taught in private schools. But they're, they're seem, some of the teachers are activists. And the so how much is this coming from an elite how, you, you mentioned the elite is now a bit out of touch with the reality. You know, I don't need to marry till I'm 40 and I've got IVF. And uh, how much is the elite um, pushing this? I'm not crazy about the word elite because I think in some sense anyone who's fortunate enough to succeed is part of that elite even if they have different opinions. But I do know what it is you're referring to. Um, again, it gets back to the problem of what people are taught in universities. In fact, uh, looked at one way, the whole dispute over pro pronouns is a class dispute. Because if you go to other parts of the country, say rural upstate New York, where I happen to grow up, you, you don't hear this kind of language because you have to go to college to learn it. You, you have to, you, you can't learn it just by uh, even going to the internet doesn't really teach it effectively. You have to spend a fair amount of time and be schooled uh, with pretty strict rules about how these words are used. You have to acquire a new language. So in that sense, yes, there's definitely a, a class element here. Yes, the, the elite from which this language issues, yes, is the, the university humanities elite. and. Uh, yes, they are very uh, committed to what they're doing. And yes, this is a problem. But as I was saying, it's a problem I hope gets corrected, at least in part, as more and more parents realize that this is inimical to their own interests as parents. Thank you, Thank you Peter. Thank you. For decades, CIS has been a fiercely independent voice working hard to promote sound liberal principles. To be notified of our future videos, make sure you subscribe to our channel, then click the notification bell. We rely solely on the generosity of people like you for donations to advance our classical liberal cause. Check out the links on screen now to see how you can get involved. <laughs>